Amen. Amen. Thank you, Julie. Our ushers will come forward. We're going to receive communion today.
and it's a pleasure to serve Jesus. We get to teach children's church. We get to. We don't have to. Because here's, the, here's what's happening. We are called to make an eternal difference. Right? You're called to make an eternal difference. And when you do something so simple as greeting people at the door, you're making an eternal difference. Listen to this. You are called to make an eternal difference with a group of people making an eternal difference. Isn't that awesome? To know that you're doing something that has eternal ramifications. Oh, it's so simple. Yeah, but it's love in action. That's why we do what we do. We're making an eternal difference. We're saving souls, and we're making disciples of all men. It's teamwork. We're all doing a little part, and God is causing increase in people's lives. I like to say, we like, I like what Paul says. He says, I've become all things to all men. Why has Paul become all things to all men? Paul says, I've become all things to all men. Why did he say it? To win some. To win some. That's the greatest thing on earth. I mean, your, your careers are important. Your families are important. But we are called to win people to Jesus. Because if we don't win them to Jesus, they're not going to heaven. We've got a lot of work to do, don't we? You look at America and Hollywood and just, you know, I was in the big city just recently, Columbus, Ohio. 800,000 people. A lot of people need Jesus in that town. That's the mission statement of the gospel. Win souls and make disciples. Do you know the mission statement of this church? About five years ago, Adam and Greg and all of us were, were sitting around and we said, you know what, we need a mission statement. And we need to make it uh, resemble the gospel. And so we put this together. Loving, reaching, and teaching all people. Is that, is that close? <laughs> Loving, reaching, and teaching all people. Wow. God brings people to us. We've got to love them in the kingdom. We don't criticize them. We don't look them up and down. We just love them. Love people. The church is the only institution where it, it exists for outsiders. It doesn't exist for its members. Its focus is outward. The key, this is the key to understanding who we are and what we do around this church. It's essential. We don't exist to make people happy. We can't possibly make everybody happy in this church. We have 450 people in the church from all walks of life, all religious backgrounds, all nationalities. Such a great diversity. We can't make everybody happy. But that's okay as long as we're all making sacrifices for the greater good of winning souls. We all make compromises because, hey, we're winning souls together. And I want to call this church, I want you to call this church home. I want you to say, hey, this is my church. I want you to become even a member of the church. But at the same time, we must realize that it's not my church in the sense that I don't own it and it doesn't revolve around me. We come to serve and put our hearts into ministry. I'm here at the church to serve others. It belongs to Christ and it exists as a soul winning station, right? We're here for new converts. A polling company polled thousands of unchurched people one time. And, and the vast majority of them, and here's the question they asked them. If you were going to go to church, when would you go? What do you think they said? Wednesday night? Friday night? No. They said Sunday morning. If I was going to go to church, I would go on Sunday morning. That's why I give altar calls on Sunday morning. Because people a lot of times are hearing the gospel for the very first time. So I'll get people to raise their hand, ask Jesus in their heart, I'll bring them down. I do different altar calls at different times because, hey, I want to win souls. We might only have one chance to do it. Can you say amen? I'm here to win uh, souls and make disciples. I'm not here to get my way. I'm not here to. I'm here to minister to people. When I had a youth group in Tallahassee, I had mostly black kids in my youth group. It was a pretty good size, 35 kids, I think, around there. It wasn't huge, but they're all black kids and. and and I'd go around to the inner city in Tallahassee, and for like nine years I drove a bus, a van, and it just wasn't an ordinary van. This thing had two subwoofers under the seats and had three video screens in it. And, and the first video screen was really large. I mean, this, this bus was going downtown, thump, thump, thump. <laughs> and guess what kind of music we played? You think we played the Gaithers? 
As much as I love the Gators, my wife is a big fan of the Gators. You think we played my, my music that I like, Striper? <laughs> or Petra? Okay, if I name your favorite band, give out a holler. It's awfully quiet in here. <laughs> Phil Keggy. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, okay. I'll get in there. Michael W. Smith. Yeah. Okay, he's still around. Yeah. That guy's been out for several decades putting out hits after hit. Wow, he's awesome. Um, a white heart. I guess we didn't listen to the same music you <laughs> Those are Christian bands. But I, I couldn't stand the music that I played in the band. Rap, and it was a lot of it was just heavy, but it was all Christian, you know. And I'll tell you, rappers could put more gospel in one song in three minutes. Than, I mean, it's like five times more words than country music. You know, country is so slow. Rappers would say a whole country song in like three seconds, you know. And I started listening to the words of these Christian rappers, and, and I was like, that's the gospel, man. These guys are telling it like it isn't. It's so exciting. And so I was playing the uh, Christian rap, and I was playing Kirk Franklin. We had a video of Kirk Franklin, and um, it was it was fantastic. So I, it grew on me, right? But I did it for the young people, and when the young people I'd seen in worship time, they were raising their hands and they're worshiping, and you could see the glory on their face. And their little faces would be, they'd be worshiping Big Jamel. He was like six six. You know, huge man, and he's worshiping God. And I was like, it's worth it. It's worth it. And when they'd bring their friends, their friends would get saved. And then I'd run the bus, I'd run to Lincoln High School, or, or no, I'd go to God Be First, and, and the football practice was going on, and I'd honk the horn, and all the football players look over at the church band. And then about four little players come running out to the church band. They would leave practice early on Wednesday night because they talked to their coach. They said, hey, we're going to be the best players we can be, but we've got to leave early on Wednesday night so we can go to church. They were so faithful. And then I'd go to Rickards High School. And the same thing would happen. Guys would come, and Doug and Alan would come out. And uh, just amazing what God was doing in their lives, and it was all worth it. The sacrifices that I made were all worth it because kids were getting saved. Isn't that what we're all about? I'm a soul winner. Are you a soul winner? Yeah. You have to be a soul winner. You have no choice. We're called to win souls. Well, I just, I just have a hard time talking to people about Jesus. Well, bring them to church and let me talk to them about Jesus. <laughs> that is the easiest thing, man. You invite people to church. A lot of people say they don't go to church because no one ever invited me. Just invite people and see what happens. You might get turned down, you know, five out of ten times, three out of ten, or whatever, or whatever. But hey, if you get one person to come and get saved, isn't it worth it? <laughs> Absolutely, it is. Uh, John Maxwell is a famous uh, teacher on leadership principles, and I went to a conference of his one time, and he talked about the the law of the lid. And I was like, oh, I've never heard that. What is the law of the lid? And he said, every organization, every business, and every church has a lid on it that keeps the population down. You know? And churches have lids on them. There's a lid holding down growth in every church. Now, that lid could be several things. It could be the attract attractiveness of your facilities. It could be the number of spaces in your parking lot. I mean, if, if a new uh, unchurched person comes to your parking lot, there's no spaces available. Well... I'm out of here. I'm not going to drive around for 10 minutes looking for a space. You know? Or if they have to park a half mile away, that's, a, that's it's not going to happen. So it puts a lid on your church. The size of your lobby. People might come in and say, see a just jam-packed lobby. We went to a church up in uh, Birmingham last week, and the size of the lobby was as the size of the sanctuary. And there were several thousand people in the sanctuary. It was huge, but the lobby was just as big as the sanctuary. And I, God led me to the architect who designed it. And I'm sitting there talking to this guy. He said, yeah, we learned. They build churches all the time. This church, there's like 28,000 people in this church. And they build churches. They built 12 churches already. And this architect says, yeah, we've learned our lesson on this church because we built the, the lobby as big as the sanctuary. He said, now we're doing that in all the churches. 
And they had two churches being built right now, $12 million projects each. So they've learned that, hey, the lobby's got to be a good size. Or even the size of the sanctuary can be a lid on a church. Have you noticed our church for the last three or four years, we've just kind of, we hit the lid, we come back down. We hit the lid, we come back, back, back down. It's not because of bad preaching or bad music or anything like that. It's the facilities. <laughs> it's a real practical thing. Or a lid could be the culture of your church. The pastor and the leadership creates a culture in a church, like uh, an accepting, forgiving con con uh, congregation. I think that's what we got. Accepting and forgiving and loving congregation. Or a congregation could be cold and moralizing or legalistic and unfriendly. Have you been to churches like that? It's the leadership and the pastor create the culture of a church. It could be a drastic lid on the church. Do lost people like the atmosphere or the warmth of the people? Is the building up to date clean? Are your greeters friendly? Do you even have greeters? How clean are your restrooms? That woman's bathroom is probably the most important thing in this whole facility. Do you have a safe, clean, and friendly nursery? You know, important. Our lid at this church could be probably several things. The parking lot's too small, the lobby's too small, and the building is too small. I mean, we got a huge lot of lids on the church. There's probably other things. Uh, growth experts say that if you reach 80% capacity, then people don't come back. Because unchurched new people don't want to be squished up against crazy Christians. <laughs> they don't know what to expect. They want to stay at arm's length away from you. And they'll come and they get arm's length, they'll come and come again. They'll come back. They don't know what to expect at the first time. Another lid is called sacred cows. You ever heard of sacred cows? We have, I don't know, we might have sacred cows here in the church. Churches put a lid on themselves. Purposely. Because they don't want to adjust to make room for unchurched people. They say, hey, we got our 70 and we don't need any more. You know, 90% of all churches in America are under 100 people. Uh, they're, hey, wow, we've got 70 people and, and they're like me. We don't have any problems. We get along. Let's just keep it right at 70 and then we won't have any problems. <laughs> Can I tell you something? When you have growth, you have tension. When you have growth, you have problems. We're solving problems all the time around this church. You know, it's just growing, growing pains, you know. Our nursery is too full. Our little nursing room is too full. We got, you know, all kinds of issues and problems that we're dealing with, but it's great. Some churches have sacred, sacred cows like dress codes or traditions, rules, styles of worship. We're going to do this style, and that's what we're going to do. A pulpit could be a sacred cow. I had a friend, he was from New Zealand, and he had that cool accent, like Australian people. He was from New Zealand. He was old school, tough man. And he, he went into the ministry. He went to this dinky little church in New Zealand, and he moved the pulpit, and one of the board members said, hey, don't ever move that pulpit. Whoa, sacred pulpit. So he, he takes it out back, and he sets it on fire and burns it. <laughs> Ain't sacred anymore. <laughs> he was trying to show the people, hey, there's only one thing sacred. That's the word of God. But people always want objects that they revere, like an altar or what have you. Objects have always captured people's loyalty. Have you noticed that? People are very, they're very religious and they're very, what do you call that, we have? You know, Stevie Wonder song. Superstition. They're very superstitious. That's why the Ten Commandments says the very first one. It says, uh, you shall have no graven images of anything on earth or in heaven. Right? Because we tend to revere these things. They become more important than people. We make processes and rules sacred. We become obsessed with the way we do church and we lose our love for people. You ever been in churches like that? 
These are sacred cows, and I've learned that sacred cows are only sacred to people. They're not sacred to God. Sunday night services are a sacred cow for some people. Uh, we had a lady leave a nasty message on our answering machine. She's a real old lady. I tried to come to church Sunday night. There was no church on Sunday night. I just can't believe it. What is the world coming to? She just gave it to us on the answering machine. Or Sunday school can be a sacred cow for someone. Or the way you do altar calls. One lady criticized me for the way I do altar calls. Or the clothes that I wear. Or that a priest wears. Or a pastor wears. Or some people have made the King James Version the only Bible that you can read. Oh, but you have, you have to have a coat and a tie. Or uh, to respect the platform. Or a woman must not wear makeup. Have you heard that one? Or, or she can't cut her hair. Or wear pants. These are rules, and process, and objects. These are not sacred. They're not to be worshipped or revered. The truths in God's word are sacred. The truths in God's word will never change. And in this church, we won't change them. We're still going to preach against sin. We're still going to preach holiness. Those things are non-negotiable. But sacred cows, we sacrifice them around here all the time. Because <laughs> sacred cows are made to be sacrificed. A case in point, the church used to sing Gregorian chants and high church of England type music. But Fanny Crosby changed all that. She was a radical rebel. She brought hymns into the church. She wrote 9,000 hymns. A lot of those hymns were bar tunes and secular songs that she changed the words to. <laughs> Is that cool? And I thought I just had that idea. She had that idea many years ago. Blessed assurance. Secular song words were changed to it. Pass me not, O gentle Savior, or safe in the arms of Jesus. Man. One biography of Fanny Crosby said this, by the early 1870s she was well on her way to becoming the queen of hymn writers. Fanny often matched her poems to familiar tunes. An example is We Thank Thee Our Father, written to the melody of the famous Adest Fidelis. She set poems to Scottish and Welsh airs and used tunes by Stephen Foster. Oh, Stephen Foster. He's old. And the founder of the Salvation Army, William Booth, did the same thing. Here's what he said. Satan would have to be battled within his own strongholds, and any means was justifiable. In other words, we're going to save people at all costs, and anything goes to save people. That's awesome. He's a radical. He decided if it would attract sinners to listen to the message of salvation. Thus it was that as the work grew, the music and street parades attracted uh, increasing crowds of people who scorned the regular services. Why should the devil have all the good music, he said. Do you remember that tune by Randy Stone? Why should the devil have all... William Booth said it before he did. Maybe that's where he got it. He was chided for his use of secular music for hymns. Then during the Jesus movement of the 60s and 70s. How many people got saved during the Jesus movement of the 60s and 70s? Anybody? Yeah? Yeah? Wow, they really turned the church on its head. You guys, you're bad. Because you brought choruses into the church. I mean, bad choruses like, Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Or, it only takes a spark. <laughs> and you mess things up. And then, you kick the hymns out of the church, you guys, you hippies. And then, <laughs> that's been going on for 55 years. <laughs> that's been going on a long time. We sing a hymn, we sing a hymn every Sunday and every Wednesday in this church. Because we love our seniors. And, and actually, I love hymns. They're the most deep powerful songs ever written. Um, we don't sing Church of England music. We don't chant or sing, or we don't do responsive readings. You ever been in Bass Chapel? Bass Chapel? 
pastor reads a phrase and the congregation reads a phrase and then the pastor reads a phrase and the congregation reads it. You've never done a responsive reading? Go to base chapel sometime. You'll really enjoy it. There's nothing wrong with it. I'm not saying there's nothing wrong with it. We just don't do it here. It's not our style. The churches that adjust and focus on major things, not minor things, they have grown and reached a new generation of souls. They're saving and baptizing thousands of people. All they're doing is adjusting a little bit. The church has been adjusting for eons of time because they want to win souls. The churches that don't adjust, they die. And they win no souls. And even their own kids don't even want to come to church. The devil gets people divided over the trappings of worship, just like the Pharisees did in Jesus' day. They were all about the trappings of worship. Some swore by the altar, swung, some swore by the gold on the altar, and it drove Jesus crazy. He said, what is more important? You're just you're nitpicking holy things. This is sacred, that's sacred. You must have a robe and a tie. You must meet on a certain day, and that's the devil, dividing and conquer. Why do you think we have so many denominations today? Because everybody thinks they're doing it the only way, the right way. And doesn't everybody think they're doing it the right way? Yeah, there's some major denominations that says everybody else is going to hell because they're not one of us. It's ridiculous. In Acts chapter 15, there was a huge, huge battle. It's when the church was first starting, and there was these Jews who got converted to Jesus, and then there was all these Gentiles who got converted to Jesus. And these Jews were called Judaizers because they were very strong, very powerful, and very vocal about what they believe. And they said, you got to do it our way, the old way. Judaizer said, you got you to get circumcised. What? I just want to accept Jesus. <laughs> they said, it's our way or the highway. And the apostles had to have a big meeting. And James, he was the leader of the church. And James said, in verse 19 of chapter 15, write that down, Acts 15, 19. James kind of set him straight. He listened to Paul, and Paul said the Gentiles got filled with the Holy Spirit just like us. I mean, great revival was sweeping the world, and people were coming to church. And thousands of people were getting saved. And there was 50,000 people in the church in Jerusalem, 50,000. And, and, and James stands up and he says this. He says, it is my judgment, therefore, that we should not make it difficult for Gentiles who are turning to God. Wow. Just don't have sex outside of marriage. Don't drink blood. <laughs> you know, some of these things like that. Right? And he said, we're not going to make it difficult for these Gentiles. We're going to accept them and love them with open arms. They come from crazy, strange backgrounds, homeless families. We're going to love them into the kingdom. We're not going to put rules on them. He said, we can't even keep our own rules. We're not going to throw it all on them. Hey, it's not about what you wear or how you look, whether your head is covered or, or, your hair, or a woman's hair is short or a man's hair is long. Whether you're circumcised or you're not circumcised, we're saved by grace, not the law. Amen. You'll find in churches today, everybody wants to bring the law. Bring back the law. A lot of churches are so rules and law oriented. It's amazing anybody goes there. We're saved by grace. Grace says, no one is accusing you. Remember Jesus with the woman caught in adultery? Where are your accusers? Neither do I condemn you. In fact, you don't have accusers. Come to the bar first assembly. You won't have accusers. Now go and sin no more. But we cling to externals. And they become dear to us. And we chase away honest seekers. And we lose more souls. And it breaks the heart of God. We worship objects of our faith and processes and the forms of religion. And our young people run from our Jesus because of all the infighting in the church. The bickering about small things when souls are being lost under our steeples. The devil's eating kids alive today. And all hell screams with laughter as they see the dysfunctional church of Jesus Christ. Fighting over chairs, fighting over hymns, <clears throat> fighting over King James or NIV, and the devil just laughs. And our kids are not even going to church because mom and dad are complaining so much. Why would they want to go there? Jesus and John taught us this. 
It's all about others. John the Baptist was a big dude, man. He was baptizing thousands of people. But when Jesus showed up on the, on the scene, John the Baptist said, I must decrease and he must increase. It's not about me. That was his attitude. It's not about me. And Jesus' attitude was the same way. He came on the earth. He said, I didn't come to do my will. Right? Now, if anybody could say, I came to do my will, it would have been Jesus. If anybody could have insisted on having it their way, it could have been Jesus. But he said, you know what? I don't even want it my way. He said, Father, I came to do your will. Nevertheless, not my will be done, but thou will be done. Even Jesus didn't try to have it his way. Amen? Let's get them into the door. Let's make it safe and cozy and preach the gospel and get them saved. Then we can put them in small groups of Sunday school classes and they can learn the finer things of our faith. I must decrease. I must sacrifice. I must do whatever it takes to get more people through these doors. Growth takes adjustments. I like Julie's word. She used it earlier. Adjustments. And adjustments takes off the lid and allows church growth to happen. You know what church, church growth means? New converts. We're not going after people from other churches. We're not trying to put on a show to attract people from other churches. We're trying to take the lid off so people have room to sit in our sanctuary and they can get saved. It's all about souls. If you have no change, you have no growth. If you have no change, you have no souls. And we should not be happy if we're not saving souls and baptizing people. Do whatever it takes to take the lid off of your church and fling these doors wide open. Let the word get out that, that we want the lost to come here. It's safe for them. They will be loved into the kingdom. Let the word spread that we love everyone, accept everyone, and forgive everyone. That's our culture. That's our climate. That's how we roll. Loving, reaching, and teaching all people. That's our purpose statement for this church. Not loving, reaching, and teaching sanctified and good looking and the people with money loving, reaching and teaching all people no matter what color or what station of life they're in but I'm so proud of this church because we have made some dynamic changes over the last few years to, to take the lid off, we're taking it off slowly and surely we made some great changes, we've changed our music we went to two services, we started a coffee hour, we paved the parking lot <laughs> when I got here the parking lot was rocks uh, we painted the building. Jerry Jones, woo! Jerry painted the building. Way about us, Jerry. Yeah, he has a contracting crew, painting contract. They painted the building to make it look good. We painted our lobby. Julie painted the lobby green. Don't say anything. <laughs> we built a new stage. We canceled Sunday night services. I thought we were going to have a split over that one. No one said anything. Thanks, girl. I stopped wearing ties, except on communion Sunday. You know, we had a homosexual come to church one time. You know what we did? I got the board together. We had a meeting. I said, one of you guys are going to have to go. No, I didn't say that. <laughs> we didn't do anything. He came in. We said, hey, how you doing? Welcome to Navarre First Assembly. He came here. Now, can you imagine what happened? He loved the music. He loved the people. Everybody's hugging him. Oh, he loved that. We're hugging. He's, you guys. He got saved. We didn't know it. He had AIDS. God healed him of AIDS. Yeah. That's why we do what we do. There but by the grace of God go I, man. Don't point fingers at people. Man, that's why we do what we do. You know what? Now he's on the straight and the narrow. You didn't even get that. Huh? <laughs> Un unchurched sinners are coming into the church all the time, and they feel loved. They keep coming back and getting saved. One young family came here, and we hugged them, and then Trey called them by name the next Sunday. Trey has a gift of remembering names. And he walked up to them and he said, hey. And he said his name. Welcome back. And the guy's jaw dropped to the floor. We've been to so many churches and nobody has ever given us the time of day. And you remember my name? 
Thank you, Trey. That's fantastic. And they've been coming ever since. Is that fantastic or what? A lady in a North Carolina diner. You know, we've been doing a series on prayer on Wednesday night. Man, I want you to come on Wednesday night. This is a fantastic series on circling your problems with prayer. Just like the Jericho march, the people marching around Jericho, the walls of Jericho, they fell down. And so this lady, she has a, a diner, and her name is Mary Hagland. She's the owner of Mary's Gourmet Diner in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. Have you, anybody ever been there? Well, she watches people. And if someone bows their head to pray, she gives them a 15% discount. <laughs> I'm going to that, that place. She said, for me, every plate of food is a gift. And I never take that for granted. And when I see someone in the restaurant honoring their gratefulness at my table, it touches my heart. Isn't that amazing? Prayer touches this woman Mary's heart. And she's an imperfect human. What do you think it does to the heart of God? What do you think it does to God when you take time out of your busy day and you pray? In the Lord's Supper, Jesus gave thanks for the meal. Didn't we just do that? And he gave thanks for the meal? I challenge you to give thanks at every one of your meals, too. Pray over your meals. Jesus spent his entire ministry praying. He spent his entire ministry. He started his ministry off with 40 days of prayer and fasting in the wilderness. He prayed a lot out in the wild open. Last week, we read the parable about the persistent widow. And I've been teaching a series of messages on prayer and seeing God do the super, supernatural in our lives. And I'm here to tell you, if you want God to do supernatural things in your family and in your life, if you want to save a soul, if you want to pray for the sick and see him healed, you need to start praying. You alone with God. Think about it. You alone with God. If we want to obey the Great Commission to go make disciples of all men, then we need to make prayer like eating. How many meals do you eat every day? How many snacks do you eat every day? Every prayer doesn't have to be 20 minutes. Sometimes you take a snack of a meal. Take a snack of prayer. Man, I got 10 minutes before my friends show up. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to stay over here. I'm going to pray. You're at, the, you're at the restaurant waiting for someone. I'm just going to get over here. I'm going to pray for a little bit. You want to see... God use you to win the lost? You want to see your pews filled up with people? You start praying and asking God for some miracles. We also learn the story of, from out of, the, out of the Talmud, the Jewish book, about Honi, the circle maker. How he drew a circle around himself. And he said, God, I'm not leaving this circle until you bless your people. That's called persistent, awesome prayers. That means... I'm not stopping praying until I get what I want from God. And we read that in the New Testament. Turn to Luke chapter 11, verse 2. I love this. Jesus said, You're going to do miracles like I do miracles. These signs shall follow you. Believers. Signs and wonders should follow you. Because you have enough faith to pray for miracles and you have enough faith to believe for miracles, the place where you get that faith is on your knees in prayer. The reason why you're not witnessing, the reason why you're not praying for miracles or laying hands on people or anything is because you're not praying. Prayer is the place where you get your faith. Verse 1, or Luke 11, verse 1 says, One day Jesus was praying in a certain place. When he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, Teach us to pray, just as John taught his disciples to pray. He said to them, gather around. When you pray, say, Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Say it with me. Your will be done on earth. Keep up, computer guy. <laughs> this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses. As we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Then Jesus said to them, Suppose you have a friend, and you go to him at midnight and say, Friend, lend me three loaves of bread. A friend of mine has come on a journey and has come to me, and I have no food to offer him. 
Look at verse 7. And suppose the one in, inside answers, Don't bother me. The door is already locked and my children are in bed. I can't get up and give you anything. Verse 8, I tell you, even though he will not get up and give you the bread because of friendship, yet because of your shameless audacity, he will surely get up and give you as much as you need. So I say to you, ask, and it shall be given to you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. The one who seeks, finds. And the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will you give him a snake? Or if he asks for an egg, will you give him a scorpion? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Is that awesome? We get not because we are asking not. We need to be persistent. Remember what I said last week. God is for you now. God is for you now. He's not waiting for you to memorize 20 scriptures. He's not waiting for you to get your act together. He's not waiting for you to get a Bible college degree. God is for you now. Say that with me. God is for me now. God is for me now. Man. Hebrews 4.16 says... Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence. That's how we pray to God, with confidence. Not with fear, we go with confidence. Do you approach your dad with fear? No, with respect. There's a difference. We go to God with respect, but with confidence. And we come boldly before the throne of God. We have shameless audacity and we ask. <laughs> we ask big things from God. God says, yeah. Come on, ask some big stuff. You know, I, I can do little stuff. People are not going to be impressed with little stuff. Ask me big things. I'll do big things for you. How many would say to me, Pastor, there's some things going on in my life right now. Anyway, I need a miracle, frankly. I need God to do something right now in my life. It's been keeping me up at night. I'm worried about it. It might be a loved one. It might be a son or a daughter. It might be finances. Anybody who say, Pastor, pray for me. Just look at your hand and say, yeah, yeah. Is it, is it, yeah. 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 A lot of hands, right? Yeah. You know why? Because most everything is out of our control. And it's a good thing. Because if it's in our control, we wouldn't need God, would we? God brings things in our life that are out of our control. You know why? He wants us to pray. The more we pray, the closer we are to God. The closer we are to God, the more He rubs off on us. The more He rubs off on us, the more we become like Him. The more we become like Him, the more sinners we attract. People are attracted to the qualities of God. Do you know that? Unsaved people are attracted by niceness. Unsaved people are attracted by love. Unsaved people are attracted by, you know, all kinds of stuff that we, godly qualities. Wow. Let me ask you this. If everybody stand your feet, and if you raise your hands, I want you to come forward, and I just want to pray with you. If I get the ushers to move this, uh, this altar, this beautiful altar, it's not sacred, but it's important. Yeah, I want you to come up, but we really need to pray. We really need to pray. Things are out of our control. Okay, scoot all the way to the front. People are coming behind you. Yes. Yes. Let's just pray. Let's begin to pray. Say, Lord, you know my need. You know what keeps me up at night. You know what's driving me crazy. You know what I'm worried about, Father. I just pray, Holy Spirit, in the name of Jesus. Everybody in the audience, just stretch out your hands to the folks who are up front. And begin to pray. Everybody pray out loud. Say, Lord, I need you. Lord, I need you. There's something I can't control or something I, 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 I can't fix. But God, I rely on you. You said if we're in trouble, we should come to you. We should pray. Lord, I'm praying right now. I don't know what else to do. I don't even know how to pray, but Lord, I'm just laying it before you. I'm just being vulnerable. I'm being honest. Lord, your, your children are here today. They're being honest with you. Lord, I just pray right now that you begin to do miracles in their lives, Lord, as, 
as they're, as they're praying, as they're putting these needs in your hands, Holy Spirit, we just pray that they'd see miracles take place. Even today, they'd see God moving and working behind the scenes in their heart, in their lives, and in their situations, Father. We love you and we thank you, Father. Lord, I just thank you for Monty. Lord, I just pray right now, Holy Spirit, you just touch his heart. Touch his life, Lord. Touch his situation, Father. Touch Cheryl, Lord. Move in her life, Lord. Do a great work in her, Father. Lord, let them put their faith and their trust in you, Lord. Let them not worry about it. Father, they're going to give it to you. They're laying it down at this altar. They're not going to go home today and they're not going to take it back. They're not going to worry and worry. Lord, they're giving it to you, Father. They're giving it to you right now in the name of Jesus. We love you, Lord. We thank you, Jesus. Touch your people, Lord. Touch your people. Move, Lord Jesus. Move on our hearts. Move in our lives, Lord Jesus. We love you. Lord, touch my sister, Lord. Encourage her and strengthen her. Lord, we love you. We thank you, Jesus. Touch my brother, Lord Jesus. Minister to him, Lord Jesus. Lord, make him the rock, Lord. The man of God, the man of faith, Lord Jesus. Lord, we love you. We thank you, Jesus. Yes, hallelujah. Lord, we thank you for Donna, Lord. Thank you for bringing her home, Father. You know what's on her heart. You know what her need is, Holy Spirit. We just pray that we'll see miracles take place in this situation. Lord, I want to hear praise reports, Lord, of what you're doing in our lives. Lord, we just thank you, Father. Touch her, Lord Jesus. Touch my sister. Encourage her. Strengthen her, Lord Jesus. Lord, we love you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus. Lord, we just thank you, Father. Touch her, Lord. Do a great work in her life, Holy Spirit. Move in her life. Move in her heart, Holy Spirit. Do something great and awesome. Set her on fire for you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. We thank you, Jesus. Lord, touch my sister. And encourage her, Lord Jesus. Meet her needs. Speak to her spirit, Lord Jesus. Wrap your arms of love around her. Let, her. let her know that you've got it all under control. That she's not alone. She doesn't have to worry. You're the God that provides for her. You're Jehovah Jireh, my provider. Hallelujah. Let's all lift our hands all over the audience. Before we leave here, let's just give God thanks and praise for what he's done. Lord, I just thank you. I give you praise for what you've done in my life. And Lord, I thank you right now for what you're going to do in my situation. You might be in the audience right now. You didn't come forward, but you still have needs. I just want you to do this. Just thank God ahead of time for answering your prayer. Just thank Him right now. Say, thank you, Lord. I don't know how you're going to do it. I don't know when you're going to do it, but I thank you right now as if it's already done. That's called faith. I thank you as if it's already done. Lord, we just thank you. We give you praise, Lord. You see your people's hands today, Father. Bless their lives, Lord. Bless them on the job. Bless their families. We're tired of the devil messing with our families and stealing our joy and breaking up our marriages, Father. We just pray a hedge of protection around our people. Lord, we want victorious households. We want successful men and women of God. We need you to prosper us, Lord Jesus. We love you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Oh, we love you, Jesus. Amen. Turn around and shake hands. Hug a neck as you dismiss today. God bless you. Truly, we trust as we.